This may surprise a lot of you, but you know that the Bible does not teach that there will be a rapture, at least not in the sense that many churches teach it today. Like last week, I did a video on the book of Revelation and talked about how it's not a book about end times and future events, but it's about first century Christians being persecuted and martyred for their faith. How it's really a symbolic book with lots of symbols about God's judgment on their persecutors, the Roman Empire, and God's victory for his people. Well, that's a topic for another day, and if you're interested, please make sure to go back and watch that video. But one of the most frequent questions that I got from that video was something like this. So when did the rapture take place? There's a lot of variations of the teachings of the rapture. The basic timeline is this, that the return of Christ will happen in two phases. First phase, uh, Jesus will come and gather the church to himself, both the dead and alive will rise to heaven. And then those who are left on earth will endure this great tribulation. But Jesus will return again and reign with the saints for a thousand years. Here's what I want you to understand. That's simply not what the Bible teaches about end times. It's really based on a lot of misunderstandings of a lot of different passages, like Matthew 24 or Luke 17 or 1 Thessalonians 4 or 1 Corinthians 15. And part of this is connected to what John wrote in Revelation 20, where John mentions there being two resurrections. But this is not talking about a final end time events. He calls the first one the first resurrection in verses 4 through 6. But notice who it was that reigned with Christ. Not the living, but the souls who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of the testimony. Who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, it's called the first resurrection because the martyrs had been resurrected out from underneath the altar back in chapter 6, verse 9, and now are reigning with Christ, sitting on thrones during this time, this thousand years of rest of the Christians. And so he calls the other one the second death in verses 11 through 15. And so we have this picture of these people who've died because of their allegiance with the beast. Those who are persecuted or they've, they've aided and abetted in Satan's wrath and war against God and the saints. And their souls came from all over. The sea, the grave, they, they were judged by God and thrown into the lake of fire. Now, some will ask this. They'll say, why does it sound like end time judgment? Well, the answer is because all of God's judgments sound similar. Whether it's God's judgment on a king or a nation or even his own rebellious children, he always uses similar language. And it's also about a misunderstanding of 1 Thessalonians 4. There are those who teach that this is the rapture, that because Paul is addressing the saints alone, ascending to the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, both the living and the dead will ascend into heaven to be with the Lord forever. This was meant to be a very comforting passage to these Christians. They were to comfort one another with these words. But we've got to wrap our minds around this a little bit. Number one, Paul's addressing a specific concern that these Christians had. They wanted to know what would happen with those who died in the Lord before he came. And so they were concerned. And Paul didn't want them to be ignorant or to mourn as those who have no hope. And secondly, this doesn't tell the whole story. Paul's just addressing the part of the story that had to do with their concern. And I'll prove it to you. In fact, turn over to John chapter 5. Jesus talks about two resurrections, but not the ones that John talked about over in the book of Revelation. Uh, look at John 5. We have two very different ways that Jesus gives life. That's what this passage is about. John 5, 24 and 25, we have a mention of Jesus giving spiritual life because he says the hour is coming and now is that people who are dead in their sins will hear his voice and they will live. Why? Because his words give life when you live by them. Then in John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus will give life in a different way. And notice the hour is coming, not the hour's here, but it's coming. And notice what will happen. Those who are in the grave will hear the voice of the Son. They will come forth and be resurrected. That's the bodily resurrection. So notice some will be resurrected to life and others will be resurrected to condemnation. But notice the hour is coming. At the same hour, those who are resurrected to life ascend to heaven and be with the Lord. Those who are resurrected to condemnation will also come forth from the grave. And so what we find in this passage and other passages is this, that Christ will come as a thief in the night. No one will know when he will return. And all of our bodies will come forth from the grave. All those who are alive will come forth. That God will take our lowly body and conform it to Christ's glorious body, Philippians 3. That people of all nations will be gathered together before God. That we will be judged. And he will separate us all, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Some to eternal life and some to eternal punishment. I hope that helps. Uh, what's the lesson? We need to always be prepared. We have to always live like Christ is coming back today and he's going to judge us according to our deeds. So if he did, how would he judge you? 